Coming up on Smart Tech Today, Matthew Casanelli and I talk about, well, the Amazon Echo Show and uh, its place in nursing homes. We also talk about setting up smartphones for elderly loved ones. Uh, a little conversation about how Amazon seems to own two different camera companies, security camera companies, and how weird that is. Uh, why you might want to stop using your smartphone as your alarm clock. Plus, I give Matthew some tips on what his next addition to his Wi-Fi setup should be. It's all that plus so much more coming up on Smart Tech Today. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by userway.org. UserWay ensures your website is accessible, ADA compliant, and helps your business avoid accessibility-related lawsuits. The perfect way to showcase your brand's commitments to millions of people with disabilities. It's not only the right thing to do, it's also the law. Go to userway.org slash twit for 30% off UserWay's AI-powered accessibility solution. And by Command Line Heroes, an original podcast from Red Hat that tells the epic true tales of developers, programmers, hackers, geeks, and open source rebels who are revolutionizing the technology landscape. Season 8 is out now. Search for Command Line Heroes on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Welcome to Smart Tech Today, where we explain the exciting, dynamic, and sometimes confusing subject that is the Internet of Things. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I am your other host, Matthew Casanelli. Hello, Micah. How are you doing today? Hello, Matthew. I am doing quite well today. Another day, another dollar, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> et cetera. <laughs> Always working for uh, the money? I don't know. <laughs> he works all for the money. Anyway, um, glad to hear you're doing things. well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's kick things off with the first bit of news. Um, we had heard some early days uh, talk about Amazon working on improving uh, the experience for folks who have um, stutters and folks who have differences in their speech patterns, um, where the company was working directly with people who had uh, differences in their speech patterns and using what they um, sort of trained with the app to make for a better experience. Now, that is supposed to still be on the way. That is supposed to be something that the company is working on. But what they have decided to release uh, as of Tuesday, we record this show um, on a Thursday, is the ability to go into the settings of your Amazon Echoes uh, by way of the ALEXA app and turn on a setting that says, hey, Give me just a little bit more time to send my request. So right now, I could say A-L-E-X-A, and then the thing would make a noise because I have it set up to make a noise at the beginning of the request. <laughs> and I could say, how many... And then it would end the request and would try to provide an answer for that. But maybe I was trying to remember what it was that I wanted to know how <laughs> yeah. many da 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 da, -da was. Um, so this is a setting that's great, I think, for anybody who just wants a little bit more time. You get you, It certainly annoys me whenever I've started a request and then, oh, man, I forgot what I was going to say or exactly how I want to word it. And then it's too late. I've got to start the request over again and probably tell ALEXA to stop because it's trying to give me some answer that's going to take 30 minutes to spit out. And I don't like having to wait for it to... Um, say it's, you know, uh, I, I couldn't find that. Let, why don't you try rewording it or whatever it happens to be? So yes, um, Stephen Aquino, who has written a lot about, um, uh, in particular, these, these, uh, these services that are trying to improve upon their ability to uh, interact with folks who have um, differences in speech patterns, uh, uh, wrote about this over on Forbes and talked about uh, this, this feature that's going to be added soon. So yeah, yeah. Uh, very cool. I might enable this myself. Uh, yeah. As I said, I have this issue sometimes too where I, I forget what I was going to say next. Totally. I mean, especially if you do have a stutter or anything like that too, that can just be a big impediment. And Stephen quotes in the article that there's like over 3 million Americans, which is just a US stat, but still that's like 
five to 10% have some sort of communicative disorder. And that's just a lot more common than sometimes people think. Um, and yeah, in the same way, I do think about basically training my parents to use Siri because I, especially yes. when you have to have the issue word and then like set a reminder for, and then whatever you want the reminder to be. <laughs> it's it was just hilarious trying to teach my mom because she would she would get part of the way through but then just freeze like a deer in the headlights and then it of course doesn't get it like that so this actually just is a feature for anybody not just people who have the specific accessibility need but obviously great for both so good on them and i look forward to seeing what else they do with all of that research we can't wait to see what you do with it <laughs> um, up next, uh, this is a, a piece from Quartz that is well worth it uh, to, to check out. Um, if you have Apple News Plus, it's possible that you are able to see this uh, within the news app. Uh, but it is, um, uh, it's talking about Echo Shows and how they have been beneficial in um, nursing homes. And the the author makes the argument that they should be standard in every nursing home. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about this? Totally. This was an awesome piece from, uh, it looks like Leela McKellen or McClellan. Um, and basically she recounts the experience of just using an echo show with her parents who were in nursing homes and things like that throughout the pandemic and at various points separated from each other in the nursing home because of, uh, COVID scares or things like that. And then just, uh, even having dementia and things like that. And over time or, I think she recounted a moment where um, the nurse is is the one who told her that her parents, I think, had COVID over the video show thing and stuff like that. And just being able to get that kind of person-to-person -person interaction was just very unique in these kind of situations. And it honestly, like, I might get one for my grandma right now because she's kind of in that same situation and just being able to a lot of the features they were talking about are just being able to drop in and just say like, hello, and not necessarily have someone holding up the phone for them is a good example, or just like remembering to charge it and things like that. Those are actually pretty common issues. Um, so this was a pretty inspiring piece. And she basically, she acknowledges some of the just hesitations that people have with a lot of this. And she's like, I don't care. It's totally worth it. Like just to be able to spend that time with my parents and actually check on them for real and play music for them from my phone and stuff like that. Or like her husband isn't as into it and doesn't want an echo show in their house, but you can do it from the phone just to call those people. And the grandparent could just have the echo show. So I thought it was a I just don't hear a ton about Echo Shows as much. I feel like they Agreed. were popular a couple of years ago. And so I'm just glad to see that they are just kind of becoming a staple in this kind of thing because it does make a lot of sense. Um, just that purpose specific thing. And it's so simple too, that it's just like at alarm clock as well. Um, but there's another article also from Wired that's basically a follow-up to this one of, I mean, not literally, but how to set up a smart home or a smartphone for elderly loved ones and kind of goes through a lot of tips about setting up different kinds of shortcuts and phone tracking or uh, on Android. If you get different launcher apps, you can make that a little bit just simpler and bigger icons and things like that, or changing the display size. Um, I have a shortcut that I call Embiggen that makes all of the yes, text I love that the one. maximum size. Yeah, that's it. And then I just like have a way to reset it quickly also, which is always, that's like my concern with a lot of accessibility settings is just, especially with a voiceover is when I turn it on, I'm like, how do I turn this off? I have yes. to use my voice. And so it like stresses me out, but getting, testing it yourself and then setting up for somebody else is a, a good way to just kind of improve those situations and make it simpler. Like the find my app is another good thing. Um, emergency contact stuff, all of that. So definitely get those articles a check if you have family members or know somebody else who has family members who could benefit from something like that. Yes. Um, two fantastic uh, pieces that are well worth a look. Of course, I'll have links in the show notes. Um, now, this is something that I had mentioned whenever we talked about the Amazon uh, press event and something that still perplexes me. Amazon has two companies that are putting out cameras um, and different types of, of camera systems. And we talked about how 
since it's the same company, whether you're buying Blink or you're buying Ring, it's all going to the same place. So Amazon makes money whether you're buying one product or the other. But Apple, for example, um, in making uh, certain devices and when they choose to release certain devices, are careful to make sure that one device is not uh, taking attention away, away from a different device. So like the iPad mini, if you sell the iPad mini, um, people might choose to get that instead of getting a new iPhone. Uh, so then they think about how that impacts the bottom line, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So just a lot of you know curiosity I've had about why the company has these two different things and doesn't sort of make them one and how they differ and what it is about them that makes them like, what is the reason to keep them separate? Well, apparently I wasn't the only one who was kind of weirded out by this. Um, Jennifer uh, Patterson Toy from uh, The Verge wrote an article called <clears throat> Why Does Blink Still Exist? Uh, the company spent $90 million in December of 2017 to acquire Blink. At the time, it was a Kickstarter funded uh, company and uh, made security cameras. Blink in January, and I'm reading from the article here, Blink in January of 2018 announced uh, its first video doorbell. And then uh, right after that, there was Ring who also had its own video doorbell. Um, it didn't take long for Blink to start to sort of uh, peter out or at least company, people were paying more attention to at that point Ring than they were Blink. And so... Instead of uh, going against the sort of big behemoth in the room of, um, of, of Ring, <laughs> Amazon just scooped up the company uh, as well. And so Amazon owns Ring, Amazon owns Blink, and they have both. And this article kind of talks about um, that, that sort of history there and talks about um, going through the comparison. Now, here is... Uh, I want to give a quote here uh, from the article that's from Mike Harris, who is the chief operating officer of both Blink and Ring. Yes, the same person is in charge of these two companies. <laughs> We're trying to give options to our customers that meet their needs. Mike Harris, the CEO of both Blink and Ring, told me this week, there's such a wide variety of people out there and they have different wants and needs. Okay. So that's... I don't... Like that did not... That does not answer my question. Because if Ring and Blink both do the same thing, then why is there... Like what 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 needs are, are you meeting by going with Blink versus going with Ring? And full disclosure... I have some Blink devices. I There was like a, a really good se sale one year, uh, probably during Prime Day. And I bought like a three pack of Blink uh, cameras. I don't use them. They just sit in a drawer, but that's beside the point. Um, <laughs> with that, um, they, the, the, excuse me, the author uh, suggests that the reason that Amazon keeps both of these open is because they could potentially see Blink as a branding lifeline. Um, we used to talk about Ring quite a bit in terms of privacy and security uh, implications and uh, good neighbor implications, uh, particularly revolving around the company's um, uh, sort of agreements and, and participation uh, with police and how uh, folks have concerns with the company kind of handing over data and also making it easy for individuals to hand over data to the police. And some people don't like that. So with that, you've got another company, Blink, that makes uh, cost-effective products that doesn't have that same stigma attached to it. And perhaps you don't know that they're both owned by the same company. And so you hear yeah. about Ring and Ring being the... Um, snitch as it were the snitch camera company and then you come across blink and you're like oh cool blink uh that's different and it costs around about the same and offers a lot of the same features that ring does so while that is not something that uh the ceo of both blink and ring is going to admit to i think that the author you know raises a good argument there um yeah. and uh, what another point is that uh 
things are different between the two. It says, to be fair, Ring and Blink do offer different solutions to the same problem and can suit different customers in different ways. Blink is very low cost and seems to be getting cheaper. $49.99 for its uh, video doorbell. It's also a very basic security camera system. Fewer features than Ring's camera. There's no person detection and poorer video quality. No HDR imaging and really bad night vision. But its app is easier to use than Ring's. I agree. Um, it is. It takes a long time to uh, figure out how to get uh, through the Ring app, even for someone who's steeped in uh, technology. I, I've had trouble uh, using the Ring app in the past. Um, it says, this is also interesting, the biggest difference is battery life. You can stick four of Blink's compact, easy-to-mount, battery-powered cameras around your home with just a drill and a Wi-Fi connection in under 30 minutes, and you won't have to worry about charging or replacing the batteries for one to two years. That's about six times less often than you'll be charging one of Ring's stick-up cams. So better battery yeah, life definitely. and the ability to keep the cameras uh, kind of where they are for longer. Um, I recently had a, a family member ask me for my advice on what security cameras to go with. And, um, you know, me kind of talking to them about the big companies and the smaller companies and who is providing what and how much of that is uh, impacted by, um, by the how much of that is impacted by uh, the the size of the company and what implications that brings. And, you know, I had actually considered Blink as one that I suggested to them because they wanted cameras that they didn't have to pull down and charge all the time or have to be plugged in in order to use them. And that is one of the good things about Blink is that um, the ones that I have, they have uh, lithium batteries in them and they can last for up to two years. So, yeah. Uh, I found this all very interesting. And I think this <laughs> article is uh, a really good kind of wrap up and understanding of the history of Blink and where it fits in the product lineup for Amazon. I think that, yeah. And exactly. I love that this is just exactly your point to summarized in the whole piece. So great article and just all good points. It is, I was just looking to, I mean, I wonder how many people know that Ring is actually owned by Amazon because right. all right. across their marketing, they don't say it at all. And on Blink's page, it says Blink, an Amazon company. So mm -hmm. I wonder if somehow, I mean, and this is, I mean, this is just probably the case. We do have our uh, weekly podcast host blinders of just, we know all of these details for us. Right. Average person might have known Ring from before, and then they probably do have that sort of association with the police interaction thing, but Blink uh -huh. itself doesn't. And Amazon actually does generally have a somewhat high favorability with people. And so, and yes, it's the because low of the cost, echoes. portable, good product mm -hmm. sort of thing. Whereas Ring is kind of like the homeowner's smart yeah. stuff, whereas like you could get the video doorbell somewhere else. Um, so uh, that's pretty interesting. I just hadn't thought about uh, Yeah, I mean, the Blink ones actually do seem better. And I just don't cringe when I hear the word Blink versus Ring. So, like, exactly. <laughs> that alone does it. Um, but yeah, market Very segmentation smart. is a... Uh, I mean, it's yeah, it's just fascinating. Like, I love the article. There's a line in the article, too, about uh, there's dozens of diaper brands. And when you have your first baby, you buy Pampers because it's the best. But then when you're on child number three, it's gloves all the way. They hold, <laughs> they're around half the price and they still hold the poop. <laughs> oh my goodness. That poor Very third sure. child. <laughs> like, like yeah, I'm so sorry, third. Like, <laughs> I was, I was the first child and my mom had three after me. And I just think of my youngest brother, the youngest of the bunch. It's like, he got loves and I got pampers. I probably got cloth <laughs> diapers. I'm old. Um, but <laughs> that just doesn't seem fair. <laughs> All right, um, let's let's take a quick break before we come back with more. Uh, I want to tell you this is so cool. Love this, love this, love this. That uh, that Userway is bringing you today's episode of Smart Tech Today. Userway.org bringing you this episode of Smart Tech Today. Userway is amazing, and their vision is one that all of us here at Twit really connect with. And I think you've seen Matthew and I talk about accessibility uh, being so important. I care 
a lot about accessibility when it comes to the stuff that I put out online. Um, I want to make sure that I include uh, alternative uh, text for images so that uh, anyone is able to, you know, see the things or read the things or consume the things or understand the things that I'm putting out there. And I know that those things are uh, equally as important to Matthew. Um, user way uh, does something really incredible. Every website without exception needs to be accessible because it's a public entity. And well, more importantly, it's because it's the right thing to do. UserWay has an incredible AI powered solution that tirelessly enforces the hundreds of WCAG guidelines, hundreds of WCAG guidelines out there. With just one line of JavaScript, UserWay can achieve more than an entire team of developers. Making your website accessible can be overwhelming, but UserWay's solutions make it simple, easy, and, well, it's cost effective. You can check out their free scanning tool to see if your website is ADA compliant. I believe we ran that uh, that tool and were able to see, oh, here's what we need to make changes to at Twit. Here's what's, uh, what's good to go. UserWay's AI and machine learning solutions power accessibility for more than 1 million websites. It's trusted by, get this, big names, uh, Coca-Cola, Disney, eBay, FedEx, and many other leading brands. And now UserWay is making its best-in-class enterprise-level accessibility tools available to small and medium businesses. Operating an accessible and compliant website isn't only the right thing to do. It also makes business sense. Millions of people will require UserWay just to purchase your products. Are you hearing that? Millions of people need something like UserWay in order to make purchases of your products. That's millions of people you could be missing out on. And when you need to scale, well, you need UserWay. For years, UserWay has been on the cutting edge, creating innovative accessibility technologies that push the envelope of what's possible with AI, machine learning, and computer vision. UserWay's AI automatically fixes violations at the code level here are some of the things that UserWay does, just so you kind of get an idea. It auto-generates image alts. It writes image descriptions for you. It remediates complex navigation menus, which of course is an Achilles heel for companies. Sometimes companies will go in and uh, do their own accessibility stuff, but what they miss out on and can't get figured out are those nav menus. They get complicated. There's lots of different drop-downs and, and you end up going, oh, I don't want to do this. This is where UserWay comes in and ensures that all of the pop-ups are accessible. It fixes vague link violations and fixes any broken links. It ensures your website makes use of accessible colors while remaining true to your brand. That's a big one. And UserWay gives you a detailed report of all the violations that were fixed on your website so you can easily see what was fixed, what was done right. UserWay is platform agnostic. So whether you're using WordPress, Shopify, or Wix, well, you can easily add UserWay. And the same goes for AEM, Sitecore, or SharePoint. UserWay integrates seamlessly with all. Let UserWay help your business meet its compliance goals and improve the experience for your users. Oh, and by the way, uh, do you remember the, um, uh, the the voice of Siri that we we all got to find out about uh, sometime after um, Apple came out with Siri? Well, of course, Siri is the world's most popular voice assistant, and uh, the the woman who was that voice of Siri has a message about UserWay. Hi, I'm Susan Bennett, the original voice of Siri. You won't hear me say something like this too often. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're looking for. But every day, that's what the internet is like for millions of people with disabilities. UserWay fixes all of that with just one line of code. Love it. Um, Susan Bennett, thank you for, for that message there. UserWay can make any website fully accessible and ADA compliant. With UserWay, everyone who visits your site can browse seamlessly and customize it to fit their needs. It's also a perfect way to showcase your brand's commitments to millions of people with disabilities. Go to userway.org slash twit and get 30% off UserWay's AI-powered accessibility solution. UserWay, making the internet accessible for everyone. Visit userway.org slash twit today. Thanks so much to UserWay for sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today. And frankly, thank you so much for existing. Thank you for doing what you do to make the web more accessible to more people. It's so incredibly important that we uh, we were just talking about accessibility settings with Amazon's Echo devices. And I, I just love that there's a company who is uh, trying to make this easier for folks because 
unfortunately, sometimes that's what's what seems to be required for companies to want to do the right thing. And so UserWay comes in and says, look, we'll help you do the right thing and do the right thing without it uh, being too much of a hassle for you. Frankly, should be worth the hassle, but for some companies, it isn't. And so that's where UserWay comes in to help that. Thank you, UserWay. And uh, let's get back to the show. All right. Vogue UK is telling us we should stop using our smartphones as alarm clocks. I've thought about this before, Matthew, and I have yet to make this change. But why does Elise Taylor say we should stop using our smartphones as alarm clocks? I mean, pretty much just to not immediately get up and stare into the phone and... Also, um, just the general looking at it at the night before, if it's not stuck in your room, you won't, you obviously can't do that. Um, and she, the whole premise of the article too, then is that she gets a lofty alarm clock, which is a, a little like fancy little kind of meditative alarm clock that's supposed to do different types of, uh, white noise type things and meditation sounds along with regular alarms so that you can kind of get the benefit of those kinds of features without actually having your phone in the same room. So it's kind of her take on having this means that allowed her to keep her phone out of there without doing it as much. Although of course, some of the stuff is set up through the app, but once you schedule it, then you can kind of move freely. Um, And I have been not using this product, but just kind of trying to do this kind of thing on my own separately. And it's nice. It's except that I just occasionally run into weird little things. Um, one actually I just resolved yesterday because my, I have a Logi pop, the little button thing that can, Oh yeah. You can press. And I have that on my bedside table and I did not realize until yesterday that it had just the, um, hub for it had just been unplugged for the last six months and that's why it hasn't been working i kind of just assumed it was dead um but since that wasn't working i kept finding that i would also leave my apple watch in my office to charge and then i was just like how do i turn off the lights (laughs) with all of the smart stuff that we have um without having to yell out to the home pod and then have siri speak back out loud at like 10 30 at night um so I thought this was, a, I mean, in general, though, it is just nice and you don't immediately wake up and look at Twitter or something like that. Not that I would ever do that. Um, <laughs> I tried to like train myself for a while to wake up and check like my membership stats the, for, the, for the membership that I run. But then also I was like, that's kind of different, unhealthy in a different way, just because it's yeah. day to day doesn't, isn't always exactly what matters. Um So kind of in general, I think the premise of this is to be intentional with how you're using your devices and that sometimes getting a smart alarm clock can be a way to replace having your phone next to you and you can just charge it in the other room and check it after a couple minutes. Um, And this guy, I even, now I'm just realizing I've been watching these YouTube videos from this monk who was talking about mindfulness and kind of waking up and taking those moments to be mindful first thing in the morning and checking your phone is pretty much the exact opposite of that. Um, right. So this product is pretty interesting. It's, it's kind of fancy. It's like in MoMA and stuff. And so it's like $150 fancy alarm clock oh, that has a right. nice glow part thing. But I thought it's an interesting concept if not very approachable in this form. <laughs> But I think I think it's something that people should definitely try because it it does make a difference. And the times where I actually don't go on social media for the first few hours in the morning, I am I don't know if you just like play classical music on your smart speaker too. You're like, there's the <laughs> I love the TikTok meme of it's just am I better than everyone else? Where you <laughs> just like ah, I haven't checked my phone at all today. Yeah, so <laughs> this is a way to maybe take some time for yourself if. Not in that rude way. <laughs> um, yeah, I so I've got an echo in the bedroom that it's not a show. It's uh, echo dot with clock, I think it's called. I think it's last year's mm-hmm. model, but I don't remember. Um, no, it's this year's model. And it um, I've occasionally used it whenever I first set up a new beta. I will set it at the same time that I set my phone uh, because I, you know, get worried about um, 
my phone actually triggering since it's on the beta. Um, there's a lot to be said for an alarm that you have to get up to turn off. Um, mm-hmm. There are... Uh, there, I, I don't know if the site is still around. It probably is. Think Geek. Um, was was a popular site growing up for me, and it probably is still around. But on it, uh, they often have these different alarm clocks. There's one where you have to solve like a math problem in order to turn it off. Um, there are those alarms that uh, have like vibration motors that you can put underneath your mattress. And so it will make a loud alarm and also shake the bed to get you up. So for people who are not <laughs> practicing proper sleep hygiene, who need that extra stuff, they can. But Regardless of all that, getting up to turn off your alarm can be very beneficial um, just in waking you up, but also for uh, just when you start your day, sort of having your um, circulation get going, et cetera. Anyway, uh, I agree with this this concept of, of, you know, I turn off my alarm and I see these notifications that have come in since the night before, and I want to turn some of them, or I want to go check on them. Um, it is a nice idea to have a different kind of alarm next to the bed that doesn't make you feel like you need to get caught up and you you know, you know put that outside of the room. But ultimately, I have not made that. And I don't know what it is that holds me up on it. I think it's probably just you know a change averse. I've done my watch or I've done my phone like this for forever. I've also got like sleep mode set up with it. And uh, my charging device is right next to my bed. Like there are all of these things that I'd have to change to change that behavior. But I have considered and continue to consider changing that behavior uh, pretty regularly just because I do think there's something to be said for not doing that. Um, At least with this product. Oh, sorry. Being told that Think Geek was purchased by GameStop, which is interesting. Hmm. Anyway, go ahead. That's interesting. Um, I feel like I just realized that this product is almost a better replacement for just buying a white noise machine that probably, especially if you're getting like a real one, I think I paid like a hundred bucks for ours. And so might as well just get a little bit more to get the alarm clock too. And then it has, it's a smart speaker as well, can connect over Bluetooth. So it's kind of serving a different niche over on that side. But yeah, that all makes sense too. It's like, I think I stopped using sleep cycle a while ago because I didn't necessarily, I don't remember exactly why, but it's kind of like as your habits change, there are a variety of products like this that can help you. So that's kind of nice. Um, this one is exciting because I think I love how, I, I don't think I know, I know that I enjoy what Wythings does with smartwatches. Wythings says, you know, instead of making a typical smartwatch, we're going to make a traditional watch that also has smart features. And now they've gone even a step further with the new um, ScanWatch Horizon. Uh, It may come to the US in Q4. It's currently in Germany, France, and the UK. And it's a diving watch that is gorgeous, gorgeous, darling, Uh, that has SpO2 oxygen saturation reading. I believe I see a green one on screen, (laughs) uh, which I immediately was drawn to. (laughs) Very pretty. Um, It's a gorgeous looking watch that, uh, again, Wythings does a very good job of of kind of combining the classic elements of a a non-smart watch with the new elements of a uh, a smart watch. It is rather pricey at $499.95 pounds or $499.95 euros. Uh, hard to know what the cost would be in the US, but they're waiting on FDA clearance before they can uh, sell it here in the United States. Yeah. And it looks like that probably is going to happen. It's just delayed. So that's why I figured it was worth mentioning. But this is very much like the Rolex Submariner. Or I just realized I've never said that out loud. Submariner? (laughs) Yeah, that's what I was like. No, wait. Um, Or the. Although I guess it could be (laughs) Submariner. (laughs) <laughs> now I'm now all of these were uh, oh, Seamaster. No. Wow, I should just those other uh, watches. I was gonna say it's a it's the smartwatch for James Bond. Um, so nice, but it is just like very stylish. So I like this. I definitely need, this is what probably a lot of watch people wanted five years ago with something like the Apple Watch, and so it's kind of in that realm. But although the article does say you can't actually dive like 300 meters or uh, more than 100 meters, um, 
So if you're actually a diver, you probably should get one of those watches. But like if you're out in the ocean, it should be okay. So that's cool. Um, in our constant and continued effort to turn human beings uh, into robots uh, by like in in the military, um, the, <laughs> there's a new set of of uh, sort of I would say new set of technologies that the um, military is working on, uh, particularly in the U.S. Army, to help further turn human beings into <laughs> robots. Um, sorry, is, is, am, I, am I editorializing? A yeah, bit do you here? have any opinion in there, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so these, this, this device is called the MDO wearable, and essentially it's a very thin device that can be, uh, printed almost onto, it's sort of put onto a shirt and then there's a, a waterproof thing that goes over the top of it. And it's a hub that is connected to different sensors that allows for those, that hub to kind of get that information and then give it to who it needs to be given to. Um, it says... It says the MDO wearable is a flexible electronics device that is light enough and small enough to be laminated into a regular shirt or the current army combat uniform. The device uses radio frequency communications to interface with wearables and embedded sensors that could collect information such as vital signs, soldier stress, heat or cold injuries, local environmental data, and signs of fatigue. So I, okay, let me, I I want to take something back because when I read the... um, The, the the start of this, it says uh, the MDO wearable could blend electronics into clothing, helping triangulate threats. So in that way, it sounds like um, a device that uses human beings as sort of radio towers and sensor towers <laughs> to give people who are, you know, away at the, the base, the ability to learn more about the env- environment and sort of what's going on. Uh, so it's like, yes, I'll send you out there so that you can survey the field and then we'll do what we want to do back here. But when you get into the, the piece, it's um, more about making sure that the soldier isn't, um, you know, kind of worn out, which is kind of yeah. interesting. It says, you can also detect and classify battlefield blasts and explosions, sending the information upstream and alerting commanders even before soldiers make a verbal report. That was the part that I thought was interesting was that I just don't know much about how the military operates. And they're talking about how a lot of this stuff is just communicated via verbal reports, which can either be unreliable or just like you can only get so much information versus like literal data streams of the heat and things like that, I thought was interesting. Of just, it, it made me think of basically what you see in video games, where it's like they can monitor every single person's health and from far away and things like that, and know how those people are doing. So it was a weird, I don't know. And I think also in in general, some of the stuff that is military tech, like five years down the line, becomes consumer tech and things like that. So just. And we've seen printed wearables too before, but just for these specific situations too, it could actually save somebody's life and things like that. So I do think the part about like, obviously, I guess it would just, you'd be able to know in the field where the person is too. And it it kind of seems like it's a triangulation thing. So I'm not necessarily defending all of that, but just as a tech, even they call it the smart dog tag because it is like, they have just that little piece of information on them and Technically, they could have a whole lot more information if they had smart informa- uh, smart trackers like this. So I thought it was just interesting. I don't know how I necessarily feel about it, but that's for another day, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Up next, uh, this is a, another win, I think. Um, Xbox is, has, has rolled out a whole bunch of features. Um, that are aimed at uh, providing more accessibility for its devices. Um, the, a lot of these changes are going to be coming forth. Uh, they put out a video called the Xbox Accessibility Showcase. And some of the things that they talked about was a way for players, excuse me, to be able to find games based... On, wow. 
One of the things that they put out was the ability for players to find games with certain accessibility requirements that they have. So there will be special tags, including narrated game menus, input remapping, single stick gameplay options. And then developers, it says, will need to follow specific rules to be able to use the tags. So that way the information remains accurate, meaning that they're going to vet it to make sure that you know people aren't just putting yes, I do this, yes, I do that for the sake of getting this game in front of more people. Um, it will need to be uh, sort of proved out in order to be able to be used. Uh, it says the accessibility tags will be available via the Xbox Accessibility Insiders League, but that will be coming to more uh, Xbox users in the coming month. There's also going to be a spotlight page. And what I think is a, a kind of cool that right now you can check out the accessible games database, which has information yeah. on a lot of these games. Yeah. And that includes stuff that isn't, that's not run by Xbox or, or Microsoft or anything. So it's got other platforms as well, but this is just awesome. I love it. Microsoft has done a ton for accessibility, especially with a, a lot of the controls, but it makes sense that just being able to actually know that the game that you buy ahead of time, supports those kind of things is incredibly important. And so I saw this and I was like, oh yeah, that's fantastic. So good job then. Good job on them. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Up next, um, it's time to talk about Google. And that starts with the Fitbit Charge 5. Um, GQ, uh, GQ UK, that's just four letters, uh, <laughs> reviewed the Fitbit Charge 5. And... Um, it's it's a it's a cute little thing. <laughs> yeah, they're just like it's a it's a smartwatch. Uh, or I mean, their headline is it's not a fitness tracker. It's much more than that too. But um, I thought that it's just an interesting look through, and we we saw this coming through a couple of weeks ago. But um, I think we mentioned it once. But this is just again another iteration in the Fitbit family. And if you don't want the big fat smartwatch on your wrist, these are. These look so nice compared to what used to feel a little chintzy. Is that the word? I don't know. That's not even really a word, but I don't know. I felt like the other ones just felt like little plastic things that you strapped to your wrist where these are getting more integrated with the bands and just kind of the aluminum and things like that that they use now is, seems a lot more high quality. So pretty interesting product. Agreed. Um, let's see what's next. Uh, but, 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 sorry, I've I've lost my my place as that often happens. Oh, it's about the the uh, new fossil smartwatch. Yes, we've got more um, smartwatches to talk about. Nine to five. Google says, "Hey, you can now get the fossil generation six. Um, of course, it will have Wear OS three uh, as uh, as you know the ability to upgrade to that, and comes in at two ninety nine. $299 for the, this smartwatch. It's kind of odd because these look terrible in comparison <laughs> to what, um, what Whitings is able to do every, every time they make a new one. This just does, uh, it looks... I just I'm glad you spoke first, design. I guess, because I was going to say some of these don't look bad. Oh, um, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't okay. necessarily like taste. the bejeweled edges on the one of them, but that's what I was going to say also is I think it's just a different taste in smartwatch or watch style. Like these are just fossil watches. And so if you don't like that style, it makes sense that this wouldn't appeal to you. It's very just kind of the straight hardware. And then like, I'm just looking at the black and um, link bracelet ones. And they do, they look like watches that I saw people who used to wear fossil watches, but now it's a smart version. And so that all makes sense to me. Um, apparently Mike is not into it though. So but I thought this, I thought this was just interesting because of that. Why things went too. that. I, I do feel like, I don't know. It's like smart watches aren't dead yet. Not that I thought they were going to completely die, but it does seem like that there's where OS three is giving this resurgence to other watches and, I mean, companies like Why Things are still just trucking along too. But what seems like it's kind of just like no news has now been fairly consistent news over the last couple of months. And I feel like that could would be a trend going forward. So if you do like false watches, there's an option for you. <laughs> but Michael will judge you. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean, hey, it's, <laughs> it's your thing. That's fine. I just think they don't look very good. 
Um, Google Maps is, uh, I think, I think I remember talking about. I can't remember which mapping application it was, but uh, paying more attention to things that uh, here in California in particular is very important to pay attention to, which are fires. Uh, Google Maps can now track fires. Uh, this is something that you know you can go to the national um, sites for being able to track fires in a specific area. And there's lots of information there. But having this available in more consumer-facing apps is uh, a really good thing, the ability to uh, see that there as well. So yes, well, this is... <laughs> go ahead. Especially if you're traveling somewhere and there's a fire. Like, right. <laughs> I think that's one of the things that happens more often than not in California lately. And even... I mean, I remember looking at places at Airbnb and then it's like, oh, wait, we should maybe reconsider this because those are all near the coast and don't have accessible routes out and things like that. And so this is a very real thing, depending on where you live, that you it's worth knowing that this stuff is happening nearby or it's just also, yeah, you don't have to go to a third party resource and you can maybe understand too why there's smoke in certain areas and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So very good detail. And uh, staying on the... Google Maps train. There's now a, a new feature called light, or will be a new feature called light navigation that is specific to bike riders. Yeah, I thought this was like, it's kind of the eco-friendly routing as well too. So it's the most fuel efficient route, as even if it's not necessarily the fastest. Um, and it can show you the difference between fuel savings and Time of uh, time of arrival too, and um, so thought this was pretty clever. Oh yeah, and then the uh, bike and scooter share options are now in over three hundred cities. So that's also a great little feature. I feel like scooters were such a huge thing in the Bay Area before the pandemic, scooters, and then I feel like, yeah. yeah, exactly. I like completely forgot, but they've kind of come back this last summer. Um, but I also just haven't really been in San Francisco or anything like that, so. I haven't seen it quite as much. I have a couple of times and I've not seen too many people scooting about. Um, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, they certainly used to be a big thing. All I'm right. Curious got some... the, just the light navigation thing. I wonder how different this is. I don't necessarily, I guess it's related to bicycling too, but they have the elevation stuff. Um, but it's kind of regardless of whether you're using cycling or if it's even available in your area too. So that's good to know. Yeah, I just, uh, so you're not having to bike up those horrible hills if you don't have any <laughs> bike to get you there. All right, let's take a quick break so I can tell you about one of my faves. It's Command Line Heroes who are bringing you this episode of Smart Tech today. I've talked about Command Line Heroes before. I love what they do. They create these beautiful, incredible, creative podcasts, these, these awesome shows, and they combine it with the most amazing graphics. Each new season features these beautiful graphics for their website, these wonderfully designed uh, and, and edited stories. I just, uh, I think it's amazing. Um, this, of course, is an original podcast where my dad, Command Line Heroes, tells the epic true tales of developers, programmers, hackers, geeks, and open source rebels who are revolutionizing the technology landscape. It offers a unique blend of historical context and current trends shaping the tech landscape. And this season tackles one question from every angle. What is that question you ask? The question is, what is a robot? Is it a servant, a factory worker, a prosthetic, a vehicle? Why do we build robots that look like us? And we often ask whether we can trust robots, but maybe the question is, can robots trust us? Science fiction tells us many stories about robots. In the future, they will serve our every need, or maybe they'll develop a mind of their own and turn against us. Maybe they will be the savior of humanity, or they'll be our downfall. Season 8 of Command Line Heroes covers the robots that are in our midst and the determined dreamers who bring them to life. Eight episodes compare the promise of science fiction to the reality of robots today. Of course, we here at Twit had the opportunity to listen to the first episode, Robot as Servant. While making this season, we discovered a robot reality that's pretty removed from the robots we imagined. And yet, all those misguided ideas about what a robot should be actually shaped what robots are. And no robot fiction shaped things more than the story we told ourselves about robotic servants. 
I got to tell you, I love the editing, the production value of these episodes. It's just amazing. It's so worth your time. Uh, each new season with such great stories to check out. I am always blown away by uh, the the work done for Command Line Heroes. This award-winning podcast is hosted by Saran Yitbarak and produced by Red Hat. Season 8 is out now. Search for Command Line Heroes on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And of course, we'll also include a link in the show notes. Our thanks to Command Line Heroes for their support of the show. We do appreciate you. All right. Um, we talked about quick phrases in the past. Uh, this is Google Assistant quick phrases. And now 9to5Google kind of has a rundown of what Assistant's quick phrases will let you actually do on yeah. your device. And this is, they're kind of saying this is still not rolled out yet, but they've, of course, done their thing and dug in <laughs> and looked at all the code. But just a little more clarity of just... Sometimes when alarms and timers go off, you'll be able to just say stop or snooze with calls, answer or decline and things like that. Um, a kind of interesting detail is they're like, if you're, when you turn on quick phrases, they're like, just so you know, if you say answer, it'll answer it. But if somebody else says it, or if something sounds like the word answer, we will answer these things. So you kind of, it makes sense with something that's, um, not not invasive, but just this personal that you'd want to make sure it actually works or you're aware that it might get triggered accidentally. Um, it's, if you're, it basically means it's not using voice match. So if somebody else in your house is like, oh, answer the phone and you're like, no, no, wait. Yeah, you're out of luck. So always I didn't want to talk to my uncle. Why <laughs> did you say I mean, answer the phone? Like your boss is calling and you're not ready for the meeting or something like that yet. And then your roommate makes just says yes. Um, <laughs> so always good to keep aware of that stuff. Um, but this is not rolled out yet. So we'll see when this gets put into Google Assistant. You ready for the next one that will probably have privacy advocates everywhere screaming? Um the Google Pixel device can now automatically record and share videos in an emergency. Now, let me be clear. Off the top, this sounds like it could be a good thing. In a situation where you get into a car accident or you're in another situation that is, uh, again, an emergency, that ability to record the screen and see what's going on around you and send that video to somebody, love that. However, can this be used <laughs> in a bad way? Is it something to be concerned about? Perhaps I'm curious to hear Matthew Casanelli's thoughts on this ability for Google Pixel devices. I actually don't think it's weird. Uh, so I guess again, one of those ones. Where you're saying oh your no, thoughts. I don't. No, 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 no. I I am not on the weird side of it. I just am considering that there will be some people who are like automatic recording a video. Don't like that. So I yeah. just am sort of making sure that that point of view is out there. So they have, um, it's part of the personal safety app, which I don't know much about, but is lauded as like a good feature of the pixels. And that with emergency SOS, you can kind of have this automatic or this record emergency video that'll go on. Um, so this is straight up a shortcut. Like this was one of the most popular shortcuts that went around in just overall ever the record police activity thing. Like this is pretty much the exact same thing as uh, Rob Peterson, I think, was a person who originally invented it, where it's just like open up the camera, record audio, send a text to your family. And this was really, uh, it went viral around the protests last year and things like that. So I'm actually surprised, like Google basically saw that and was like, let's just put that in the phone. Totally makes sense. And it can record up to 45 minutes and then you can let it disable it halfway through and stuff like that. So I think this is just a great, it's like, why not? These are as smartphones, it's been one of the biggest tools in just bringing awareness to emergency situations where stuff is happening that you wouldn't know about in a truthful way without the recording of the video. Um, and so having this built in at a system level, I'm all for, even though I think, it, I mean, I even ran into a thing where I was like, there was all the there was some like weird looting and stuff that it was hard to process in real time. And I was very unaware and ignorant. And I took that same shortcut and was like, if you see that stuff happening and then people are like, you're basically helping or like it can be used for completely the wrong purposes that way too. And so it is very much how you use this stuff that matters. And 
if you are using something in the wrong way and aren't aware, learning and then just accepting and doing it in a new way that actually is appropriate is important too. Um, so I do think this needs to be used with caution because just even just like maybe letting people know that you're doing an emergency recording or something like that. Um, but this is also just better than the shortcut itself, which in many ways was pretty limited and still very beneficial, but it doesn't automatically record it or back it up or anything like that. So it should definitely be a system feature of all smartphones, I think. And nice. easy to access as well. Yeah, that's I think that's the big thing. Um, next up, Arlo has expanded Google Assistant support on its uh, for for smart display alerts. So Arlo, you may remember, is a uh, security camera manufacturer, and lots of folks really like the Arlo devices. Um, it is, a, I think, a well designed security camera and kind of is in competition with uh, some of the other big players in the space and does a good job at the features that it offers. Uh, but it is has offered kind of an update and improved access to some of the stuff that you can get um, on your Google Assistant smart displays. So the alerts have improved. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm not as intimately aware with what features are available with Google Assistant, but the 9 to 5 Google article is saying that this is the first integration of these spoken alerts for package detection, person detection, animals, and vehicles um, through Google Assistant stuff. So I'm not sure if that means that it could show you before versus it now is just also like, hey, somebody's at the door. Um, but this seems like it didn't this just come out with, um, I think Apple just did something similar or like it kind of does seem like all, all of the companies add these kind of features throughout the year in at, in lockstep by year, if not by at the exact same time. So this kind of stuff is always just good to see. You not just like get to your smart display later and your package has been sitting on the back step for four hours and or <laughs> is no longer there. So I like the spoken alerts, although I, it does with the Echo almost every time it freaks me out just because I still always forget that I have that one in here. And so it's just like, there's a package outside. And I'm like, who was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's the, the having those alerts is nice until you forget or somebody else is there who doesn't know that it's going to happen. And then it happens. Uh, those alerts still freak out my dogs. It doesn't cause them to bark but they always are, they sort of look up and then they come running to me like, what is going on? Um, so it's kind of funny. I, they just don't happen enough that, uh, you know, that that's the extent of it. Uh, up next is a review of the new Google Nest doorbell. Um, and this is the, the one that is battery powered. And essentially the Verge says, hey, this is great if you're not able to wire your doorbell and i agree all of those why all those battery powered doorbells are fine but the best way to have a video doorbell is one that can be wired um i think that it's it, you get more features and most importantly like it's easy in your house to go up and I don't have any security cameras in my home, but um, when I did, I could go up and, um, you know, take it down and charge it real quick. But the ones that are outside of your house, there's something kind of annoying about having to go out and, and uh, replace the battery or do whatever you need to do. And then you've got a period of time where you don't have a doorbell uh, or, you know, it's not the doorbell that people are used to or what have you. And so I think... Um, if it's possible for you, I do think that the better doorbell is one that is wired so you don't have to charge it. And it also means that the features work a little better because it doesn't need to take rests um, to cut back on power use. Exactly. And and the Verge just kind of warns, the, yeah, like these aren't clearly better than the old versions. There are various trade-offs that you're in, you end up making depending on the kinds that you get. So definitely worth looking into. And there's tons of reviews online now for this kind of stuff. So if it fits for you, you'll find something. And then this next one, Nest Renew, it's a way to prioritize clean energy and cost savings um, for devices that will auto adjust the thermostat. I don't know about you, 
but I have weird, weird, weird feelings about my thermostat being automatically adjusted. Um, <laughs> there, I have a, an Ecobee smart thermostat and I, because I started to set this uh, special sort of discounted my area up at one point, I get regular emails to this day saying, hey, get this set up, get this set up, get this set up. But when you do so, then it can be automatically controlled outside of your ability to control it. And that is why you get like a rebate afterward. I just don't like giving up control of something in my home to someone else, even for a certain amount of money. Um, it, it weirds me out <laughs> and feels like a violation. And then it also means that they, you know, they have access to uh, perhaps more of my data than they already do. Of course, when it comes to uh, utility companies, that's kind of the whole point is that they can see what my um, usage is because that's how they charge me. So it's not too much more, but on top of now having the ability to see how much electricity I'm using, using, they also can control the AC or the heating. And I'm just not a fan of that. So not, not wanting mean, to use these kinds of features, but I'm curious if, uh, and we saw in Texas that uh, a lot of people had issues yeah. with this. <laughs> Um, That's what I was going to reference. Is gotcha. There's been some clear examples of that recently. Um, I thought this was. Oh, I feel like this is one of those services where they have the main service so that they can add the one on top um, with the premium tier. And so I heard on Stacy on IoT, they were kind of talking about this. Is just the clean energy match where they can basically invest in renewable energy credits for you automatically when you use something like this. Um, and so I thought that maybe was like, I don't know. I mean, obviously that renew service can be great on its own, but it's kind of like, it's really going to be the most beneficial for the people who use the full thing where you can also get those credits. It's like, otherwise you have to manage that stuff yourself. And it's in many ways, like for a lot of people, not worth it. Um, so that this service can do that for you. And get the renewable energy credit back automatically. Um, so I I honestly don't know much about that because I'm not that into that field, but I thought that did sound like a very beneficial thing if you're in, in on that level. So makes sense. And then the tool itself manages it for you. So then in many ways, it like literally could pay for itself. So that kind of stuff can be beneficial whether or not your personal experience <laughs> is perfect depends on your situation too and the home too like i think for massive homes stuff like this probably is worth it because ultimately you're just wasting energy all the time and you can like get your money's your money's worth and back with this so hmm. could be good it's unclear so um scooter x in the chat yeah. Okay, good. I'm I'm glad we're on the same page. ScooterX in the chat had originally said that this uh, does not control your thermostat, but it does. Um, it's not necessarily being done by external sources. By using Nest Renew, it is done with the Google Smarts kind of directly on your device. So it is still kind of giving over control, but with Nest, folks are already used to giving over control because that's how Nest works. That you know, it's supposed to get smarter and better, uh, change the schedule in your home. So um, that doesn't feel as weird. But again, for me, it is weird. That's why I went with the EcoBee thermostat because it didn't have that weird um, f learning feature that I did not really want to use anyway. So um, and then there's also like a pay subscription for Nest Renew, ten dollars a month. But I don't yeah. understand what I'm paying for. Am I am I paying more money to use my AC less? Like what? I don't I don't know. Maybe it's like it's a, a sort of um carbon neutral kind of thing. There's a it's in early, early Well, that's beta. the premium that's the energy match thing, is what I was referencing. So the the basic thing is free. And then if you actually are using um like the carbon emissions and things like that. If you actually want to take advantage of those energy credits, they'll Got literally it. manage the, that process for you. Yeah. Okay. So wait, you're paying 10 bucks to have them um, tell you what you need to pay to... I think they do the whole paying? investment and credit process for you, which otherwise is a manual thing that you'd have to claim. Got so it's it. just, so I think it's like... Obviously, it's not going to cost them ten dollars a month or whatever, but for you, it's it's worth not 
spending two hours doing that every month. And it's to, and if you make a hundred dollars back, it's worth the time basically at that point. I don't, yeah, exactly. I'm not as into intimately inf- familiar with that kind of stuff, but it sounds like some people spend their time to go and get those energy credits that otherwise aren't just like given to you. You have to actually claim them. Um, okay. So this will that do makes it for sense. You. Yeah. Yeah. I just got an email about an energy credit that we'll be getting on our next bill, um, which is kind of neat. Anyway, all right, let's uh, move on to talk about Apple. Uh, The few little Apple bits and bops. Up first is the Starling Home Hub, uh, which we've talked about before. Originally, this was a subset of the HomeBridge uh, system, which was a way, which is a way to add non home kit devices to your home kit setup. And the original system included a Nest uh, plugin that lets you add Nest devices to your home kit home. Well, the person who made that realized people sometimes just want to be able to add their Nest devices. So having HomeBridge entirely kind of gets in the way. They just want one thing that does that for them. So you could buy the Starling Home Hub and be able to get access to all of your Nest cameras on your home kit uh, setup. And I should be clear too, it's not just the cameras, it's also everything else that Nest makes, including the thermostat we were just talking about. Um, With this, you can now add even more of uh, what, what Google has announced from Nest uh, to your HomeKit home. So basically, Starling Starling Home Hub continues to update its system uh, to make it work quite well um, for the latest cameras that are there uh, from Nest. Yeah, this is pretty beneficial, especially, I guess the one it can't do is Nest Secure, um, is what the 9to5Mac article mentions. So if you are using that, you also have to use the Google app, but in general, not having to use the Google Home app is usually the goal um, for somebody who's into this situation. So you can like do all the automation type stuff and even um, like enable the lights and things like that. So pretty solid setup. And I, I guess I'm curious, I didn't know that to it uh, earlier this year, they did AirPlay to Google Nest, which we had missed. So pretty, pretty good roundup of benefits there. Agreed. Uh, this next one, we love to talk about uh, blinds on the show, motorized blinds. Um, Eve motion blinds uh, are, well, I should say Eve motion blinds motors are just around the corner. Um, these are the sort of motors that let you control your blinds um, to actually get them, you know, working on your home kit setup. Um I reached out to Eve about this, and they've been working uh, with these this this company that makes the blinds for a little while. So nothing new there, but the um, addition of the HomeKit version that'll be out in 2022 is kind of the new news there. So uh, I will do my best to because I don't know that we've had a chance to review any of the. Uh, home kit blinds. And it's something that we talk about regularly enough that I'd like to get to do that. So um, I'm keeping an eye on that for sure to be able to see uh, how this system works in particular and being able to use that when it rolls around. Yeah. I'm curious if this is also sort of like we just saw the Akara um, motor. Those are for the roller blinds itself. So I'm curious if this is the actual these are the, just the motors or if it's actually the blinds too. Um, like if it's, this is just going to be connected to what you already have, um, mm-hmm. but it'll all work with thread and stuff like that too. So Eve keeping on that thread train as usual, which is good. <laughs> um, one of the things I was excited to see the other day, nine to five Mac put out an article talking about the uh, second beta of iOS 15.1, which will roll out to users at some point soon. Uh, many people are on iOS 15, but making the jump to iOS 15.1, Apple's still working on that. And the second beta includes the ability to finally uh, set up automations based on humidity. So if you have a device in your smart home, in your home kit uh, smart home, you can now use the humidity levels to make a change in your smart home. So one of the things could be that if the 
home drops below 40% humidity, then you automatically turn on your humidifier. Or if your uh, home goes above 60% humidity because you live in Florida, uh, then you can turn on the dehumidifier. Uh, or in a bathroom where you've got a shower, uh, to have the exhaust fan connected to a smart switch, then when the humidity in the uh, bathroom gets above a certain point, then turn on that exhaust fan. And when it drops to a certain point, by golly, you get to turn off that exhaust fan. Pretty cool idea there. So lots of different nice. automations you can do um, with this with this feature. And I, I think this was one of those features that used to be part of HomeKit, but just wasn't in the Home app because like I've seen posts on Reddit of like, you've been able to do this in Eve or the controller app for HomeKit, but just it was never exposed in the in the Home, yeah, the home uh, app UI, which is just always so weird. But I'm glad that this is here too. Um, except that I still have the... I don't think in my research, I remember that most of the... Um, dehumidifiers didn't have just that on off setting. And so I was trying to do the whole smart switch thing and have it just automatically do that. Um, so I guess this, because it's actually built through HomeKit, as long as it supports that, it'll actually work. That's great. Agreed. All right. Uh, then the last one is a new uh, presence sensor. Um, it's the OnVis or on this motion sensor, which tracks presence in a room, but it also has some other built-in features. So on top of tracking presence, it can track, oh, we just talked about humidity, uh, temperature. And you know what? I am tired of seeing all of these, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Presence detection devices that aren't as simple and smart as the ones that you can install in a doorway where when someone walks through the doorway, they are in that room and are considered present until the device detects that they have walked past that um, sensor again, at which point you know that the person is out of the room. That's such a, yeah. a clever way of doing things that's so much better than a presence detector that um, says the person is no longer present simply because they haven't seen movement in a while. That's not how I want my presence detection system to work. My presence detection is very room-based and in, in sort of my logic setup, it is a room-based setup where you go into a room, you're in that room until it is clear that you've left that room. Not, okay, he hasn't moved in 15 minutes, so that must mean that he's not there anymore. Um, yeah. No, it's just that I haven't moved. Uh, I've, I've you know, sat too still for this device to detect that I'm uh, no longer, or to detect that I'm still here. I do feel like... I went, that is just like an odd choice for this headline because that isn't really, it detects motion. And maybe they were just yeah. trying not to say the motion sensor detects motion because it's like, duh. Um, <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, that is like exactly the same problem. And I run into it all the time because I I set up these uh, foam boards with sound uh, panels on them to reflect audio or not reflect audio, I guess stop audio from being reflected, but I'll often move them around the room. And sometimes I put them in front of my motion sensor and then 10 or like 20 minutes later, while I'm recording a video, all of the lights in the room turn off or yes. I also take naps on the couch behind me. And so I'll be laying there and all the lights will turn off, which is great. I guess if I hadn't turned them off already, but then if I just turn and roll over, all the lights turn on oh, and no. it's kind of like, it'll just wake me up. Um, so I do also want actual presence detection and not just motion to, yeah, they totally oversold it in this. It's just a motion detector. Um, so just a nice little cheap one though, which is good. Yep. <laughs> All right. Up next, a few more bits of news before we get to our picks of the week. Um, you know, one of the things with, with smart tech that we often, um, there's sort of a trend is that it's these sort of compact devices that we can use uh, for all sorts of, 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 of tasks that we've never been able to accomplish before in um, such a small package. You know, the, that's kind of part of what makes uh, smart tech and IoT and internet connected things so awesome is that with that, we get a more powerful device uh, or set of devices that can do all sorts of things that we need them to do. And 
there was a story uh, that went out that got some blowback for the um, doctor involved in the story originally. Yeah, and the doctor exactly. kind of had to go f- go into ex- explanation for why they were using this device. Um, it's a story about an eye doctor who is using his new iPhone uh, for taking photos of someone's eye and having that information um, to you know better help their patient. Now, we should talk about it, but I do want to take a quick second to say, I um, not. I mean, it's been a while now, but I remember going into the doctor because I had a, a skin condition that, that popped up, and the um, my my sort of regular care doctor did not know what was going on, and so they needed to send it to a specialist um, to look at a, a dermatologist, and so the doctor ordered some special name for this this uh lab test or lab that i needed to do and it was like a you know a derma scan or something and so i pictured like going into this room and having these like super macro camera you know super up close scanning my skin or something like that and instead in walks a person who is holding a camera that i have not seen since middle school in our school's library, because the librarian was in charge of the different technology, a digital camera that was a trillion years old and didn't even have like a uh, like a zoom lens or anything. It was just a an old school digital camera. Now, mind you, those old school digital cameras at the time were very expensive, but you know, the person proceeded to take photos of me, of my uh, skin and send them to the dermatologist. But I was thinking it was some fancy contraption, you know, that had like, I don't know, subdermal (laughs) processing or something. And it just ended up being an old uh, digital camera that it would have, I would have gotten, they would have gotten better pictures if they had just used a modern iPhone. So all of that's to say, like, sometimes the technology that uh, these healthcare workers are using is just what they are used to using and that it's not something that is necessarily like the best thing that could be used. And so if a doctor has a better tool available, there's not really an issue with using it. So anyway, this Apple Insider article kind of has the doctor explaining um, his whole thoughts on using the uh, iPhone for uh, treating patients. Yeah, and it's just like that new macro photography and the the wide angle camera on the iPhone can now has a. I just didn't know this before. It used to be fixed focus, and so now I can autofocus up close in detail. And it's like he instead of using the entire, they call it the slit lamp eye camera. That is the one that you just like when you go into the eye doctor and look on either side. And he would hold the. He used to, but even since the iPhone six came out, like hold it up to that and take a picture of what he saw through that. And it's obviously not like a retinal scan that you want to use, but it's basically just for um, reference over time. He's like, it's documentation. I I take a picture on the day that we do the surgery. And then six months later, you have the same kind of picture. I can just see what's changed. It's not like this is the scan. And he's just like, you walk into the doctor's office and he's like, let me just snap a photo of your eye and we're good to go. But at the same time, I mean, if you've seen some of these photos, you can get wild detail in people's eyes mm-hmm. now. So the macro stuff is is pretty cool to check out. And like you said, it's the miniaturization of the technology is what's so cool because he also talks about, it's like, I used to do this with the DSLR and then I'm transferring SD card files over and just instead people can take it at home with their phone, send it to me and I can track what's going on. Or when we're in the doctor's office, you can just airdrop it to somebody or something like that. So I thought this is just a a cool detail and more insight into that viral article that just went around last week. It's like, this doctor's using an iPhone to like check the eye health. And it's like, hey, that's the the time we're living in. Agreed. Um, All right. Let's see. Uh, there are some these ones updates. are all just a quick, yeah, a quick yeah, some quick stories. firmware updates. You want to you want to go through those really quick? Sure. Um, so the AirPods Pro, and I guess I'm not sure. I guess AirPods Max don't have this part, but the conversation boost feature was just added, so that 
um, they announced this at WWDC, but actually, you know, I honestly wish I had this, uh, maybe, maybe the, uh, sound cancellation feature, but there's a uh, lawn noise going on outside for my neighbors mowing his lawn. And I wish I could isolate the sound, which is one of these features is you can isolate and get rid of background sounds or conversation boost is also, um, if you're wearing them and you're like in a crowded environment, you can directionally listen just to the voices and stuff like that. So this is a cool, in many ways, um, people talk about noise control on AirPods as augmented reality, because it is like, you can literally hear conversations better than otherwise with this kind of tech um i have that with airpods max where if you um the weirdest thing is if you take your fingers and just rub them next to each other you can just hear your fingers in a way that you couldn't normally because it's like detecting for little sounds and it's it's like i can actually hear better um which i just realized is another one of these features that i didn't include in here um there's audio accessibility or you can make an audiogram of your ear profile. And then if you're using AirPods, I think it's only for Macs. I can, I can find the article um, in a second, but it can actually account for like problem hearing issues that you have and tune the music so that you can hear it better. And I saw um, Dave Wiskus, who runs like a YouTube um, agency was talking about, he's like, I've heard music that I haven't heard in years because of this and was like basically crying because it's just like beautiful. And I was like, I actually might, I need to try that because I used to play the drums in my bedroom with the door closed and stuff like that. So it, I definitely don't have great hearing in one of my ears and I'm curious if I'm uh, missing on anything there, but, um, other AirPods features, they have Find My Now so that using the Bluetooth signal on those devices, you can actually find them instead of it just being last time, especially with the AirPods, just uh, in the case is like the last time you open the case um, and they can actually play sound through the headphones themselves too. So I haven't had a chance to test this, but I remembered earlier this summer, I really wished this was out because I was trying to find one. And it's like, why can't the AirPod just play noise so I can hear where it is? Like, it seems very, it's kind of wild that we haven't had this until then. Um, But they also have a notify if left behind thing, which can be nice too. So if it falls out of your pocket at the coffee shop or something, um, you can get back to it. And then um, other parts, uh, the spatial audio stuff, a lot of times people, especially for music, and if you're out on a walk, the spatial audio can be pretty weird. Like if you turn a corner, it will like try to track that your head is turned, but then it realizes you're facing another way and the whole sound field shifts. And so it can just be kind of an uncomfortable experience for people. And so Apple did add an ability um, earlier in the betas, but now it's available now where you can turn off just the head tracking feature. And it'll still have a soundscape around you, but it'll just kind of be positioned yeah, like straight that. forward. <laughs> but like, I, I, don't I like thought I was going to. Yeah, it's, I, it's really good for movies. It's less good for audio. But also once I turned it off, I did just, it felt weird to both have the sound in front of me. But then I just am like looking over here. And so it is like, I almost imagined like it's like a little like bubble around you that's floating with you, even though that's still kind of what it was, but it's just like has no give to it. Um, I'm not, it's kind of, it's a very sensory experience. Um, yeah. And it's so certainly a it personal off, you know. experience for sure. Cause yeah. for me, I move around too much to have this thing start playing audio behind me. I don't, I want it to always be in front of me. And so the, the bubble to always be in front of me as opposed to it trying to be cute and play the thing behind me because I'm, I've walked away from my iPad to go do something at the, uh, <laughs> at the counter. I, I, I am too ADHD for uh, it to try to be cute with the placement of the device. So yeah, I just, I turned that off um, and I was happy to have that feature be able to be turned off. Um, it's just not for me, but again, it's a, a, a very personal thing. Um, and then another thing is just that the original Apple watch is officially vintage, which according to Apple standards means that they're just like not really doing repairs on that anymore <laughs> in any sort of way. Um, but I thought this was just kind of 
fascinating and uh so long and good night to the apple original apple watch because that is pretty pretty old at this point but um still there there's the new ones are going on sale i guess friday morning tomorrow as we record so it'll be interesting to see reviews of those come out and now his watch has ended <laughs> yeah. uh, but I'm so of it Although apparently uh, um, Game of Thrones isn't popular anymore. <laughs> I've seen some backlash to the uh, oh, yeah, new show too. coming out. Um, but uh, another quick feature that I saw too that I just didn't even realize I didn't have set up that you need to turn on now is with the new weather app that came to Apple's devices. Um, it's finally like doing the deep dark sky support, but you actually have to turn on weather notifications. And so there's options for... Um, in the app to go set up all your notifications. And I've been having trouble. It's like there's weird uh, location permission issues sometimes. So always worth checking on if you didn't have that set up. All righty, folks, let us move on to our final segment, our picks of the week. I'm going to do mine uh, first and then we'll get to Matthew's. Um, My pick of the week is one that I have uh, been trying to solve for myself for quite some time. Um, on this show, on MacBreak Weekly, and on iOS Today, inevitably, there have been plenty of stories <laughs> about people wearing their AirPods Pro at night and then waking up to either them chewing on their AirPods Pro, thinking it's a piece of candy, oh my or goodness. having to go to the hospital because they've swallowed an AirPods Pro. Um, and that is not fun. So... I kind of started to side-eye my AirPods Pro whenever I would put them in at night because I like to listen to audiobooks to help me fall asleep. And so I have been looking for something that is a little safer and that I feel more comfortable about doing at night. And lo and behold, there's a company called Acoustic Sheep. Let me be clear, that's sheep, not sleep. (laughs) Acoustic Sheep that makes um, some purpose-built headphones for sleep. So let me grab them here. Oh, you have Um, some nice. Yeah. So I've I've been using these and I am uh, quite impressed. So it comes in a little box um, with the device itself as well as a cable for charging. And uh, there are two different types of headbands. There's a a fleece one and one that is made of this like uh, sweat wicking material. So if you're a hot sleeper, like I am, um, then this will be helpful to sort of wick away sweat that you might have. Because I was kind of worried anytime something goes over my ears, like these headphones right now, immediately I get warmer. And part of that is because of the way that we uh, remove heat from our bodies. A lot of the heat escapes through our head. That's why there are stocking caps and things that we wear in the winter, because the stocking cap helps hold in the heat that escapes through our head. Our ears, because they are thin and the capillaries are right near the edge of our ears, those are particularly areas that let go of the heat. So when you wear something over your ears, it traps that heat in there, which makes your head feel hotter, which makes your whole body feel hotter. And so I was worried wearing this over my ears, it was going to be an issue. Luckily, this is um, a moisture wicking and uh, it, it, it di- I did not have the issue of feeling too warm. Now, I nice. am a... Yes, Scooter X, exactly, like an elephant. Um, I am a side sleeper. And so that's always been an issue for me is that with AirPods Pro, I pop one in my ear when I lay on my side. And the other ear just doesn't have anything in it. Because if I was to lay down with it in my ear, it'd be very painful. And so inevitably, I end up just having one. But then sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and want to switch sides. I always fall asleep on my left side. We've talked about the reasons for that before. Uh, if you oh, I do too, baby. Issues, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every single night I think about that. (laughs) (laughs) Then it's it's a great way to lay uh, because of the way that our stomachs, I should say the typically the way that our stomachs are, it's helpful for that. Anyway, um, but I don't have acid reflux issues at night. And so I can lay on my right side as well. And sometimes I'll wake up and then roll over. And so then I have to go get the other AirPod, put it in, put the one that's in my ear into the case, and then fall back asleep. Not fun. but as a side sleeper, it's just kind of what I had to deal with. So with sleep headphones, um, the the speakers themselves are made so that you can be a side sleeper. So I'm going to show you how this works. There's a little, they call it a hook and loop fastener up front. It's uh, many other people would say Velcro, but um, that's a brand name. So um, 
the the hook and loop fastener opens up and inside is a little module. And I got to tell you folks, please appreciate this moment right now because the one complaint I have about this, which is going to be the case for any sleep headphones, is that it is complicated as heck to get this, the thing back inside of, of the oh, yeah. uh, headband. So just so you know, I am sacrificing um, quite a bit right now to show you this. Um, <laughs> Because I took it out, obviously, when I first got it so that I could wash the headband because it's machine washable. And obviously, I wasn't going to put it on my face without washing it. Um, And so I pull this out. And you can see we've got this central module that has a battery inside and a little cord. And you'll notice that it's bendy um, so that if it happens to be kind of placed in front of your head, it will um, it will fold kind of in the middle. And then two uh, cords, which run to the speakers that are also inside the band. So trying to get in here so that I can get it out. And um, what I love is that they give you clear indicators of how these things are supposed to be placed in the instructions. And so these are um, separated between the right uh, headphone, which has a little R on it. But on top of that, the right headphone has red stitching, red for right. And the left headphone, it's not uh, purple for L for lavender. Sorry, it's green. Say L- Lello? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's Lello, yes. No, it's 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 lean. Uh, it's green, uh, which is the left headphone. Uh, so I'm trying to get that one out of there. And so now I've got the module here. So um, you can see that the two things are attached with a micro USB um, cable. The gray side, the gray felt goes on the inside, like towards your ear, and the white um, sort of rougher felt goes on the outside. So each of these um, are essentially placed inside of the headband over where your ears go. And then this main uh, module has uh, the battery that charges it, but it's also the Bluetooth module as well. Um, So you unplug it and you plug in the charger uh, it says five volt one amp, but I don't have any five volt one amp chargers, so I just use a five volt two amp charger, which is the standard old school uh, iPhone charger, the little tiny brick, and that was fine. It's almost a cube um, that charged it just fine. And the middle button, basically, like almost any um, non Apple Bluetooth headphones, you tap and hold it down until it makes a sound. Uh, and the speakers, <laughs> yeah, and then you you find it in the uh, Bluetooth settings and you connect it. These also these buttons work. So once you sort of get used to it, I had mine off to the side. I could feel those buttons and turn up or down the volume, and then press the middle button to pause play um, as I wanted to. So there are some controls. You can't like there. raise your eyebrows and turn up the volume. Yeah, no, sadly, no, you can't do that. Um, but one of the things um, <laughs> my my AirPods have been giving me. Uh, lots of issues. And so I haven't been using them at night to sleep with uh, because they the right one is just basically, it's almost kaput. The howling and whistling and crackling is all very bad at this point. Um, and so I've been using another pair of headphones. And the problem that I had with that other pair of headphones was that while they were comfortable, because it was just a little pop it in my ear thing, the lowest volume level was still way too loud for me at night. If I turned it down again, then it would completely turn off the audio. Mm -hmm. And so what I had to do was, because I only used one, I would go into the accessibility settings of my iPhone and I would pan the audio so that most of the audio output was going to the earbud that I wasn't wearing, which made it quieter in my um, in the one that I was wearing. So I turned it down as far as I could. And then I made adjustment about negative 50 panned to the other uh, ear earbud. So that way it was quiet in my ear. But then I would have to remember to go back in in the morning and turn it back to standard zero zero so that when I was listening during the day, I didn't have that to worry about. And that was the thing about AirPods Pro is that you can turn them down really far. And so it was easy to still uh, be able to adjust it how I wanted. These, because they are made for sleeping, um, the lowest level is really quite good. And if you want to make it even quieter, 
you can just sort of raise the headband up a little bit so that it's not playing directly into your ears, it's sort of playing above your ears. Or shift it, uh, shift the um, little rectangles a little bit forward so that when they're placed against your head, they are kind of, you know, right behind your temples instead of directly over your ear holes. And that was enough to make it quieter as I needed to. So making light adjustments to the... Um, to the positioning of these speakers was enough to uh, make it exactly how I needed it. And then on top of that, um, the it's super soft. And it is, like I said, I'm a side sleeper. I was able to lay down. I thought for sure. I was still skeptical. I thought, I'm going to lay down on this and it's not going to be comfortable. And I'm going to be uh, kind of bummed out because it won't work um, as I wanted to. I laid down on this. It didn't hurt my ear. It didn't hurt my head. I was able to sleep over the course of the night. And then it also had the added benefit of keeping like my hair out of my face Um, because the top of it sort of went up here and then the rest of it sort of went down over my ears. And so on top of being able to play sound into my ears, it also lightly muffled the sounds in the room too. So you get kind of both of those things at the same time, a little bit of um, reduction in the decibels of the room around you and then whatever it is you want to listen to. So I am a super fan now of Acoustic yeah. Sheep's sleep uh, phones. The company makes several uh, different kinds. Some are more expensive because they have um, like built-in sound effects that you can do. So if you just want to hear like, you know, the basically it's like it becomes a noise machine. But I didn't, I don't want a noise machine. Um, and uh, the, the pair that... Uh, I ended up with is um, $99.95 uh, for these sleep headphones. And um, yeah, it's a Bluetooth. Like that, if there's one, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? If there's one critique that I have, it is they are Bluetooth 4 instead of Bluetooth 5. Um, I wish that it was the more modern Bluetooth because I did at one point, I went, I put them on while I was in my bathroom, you know, brushing my teeth and getting ready to lay down. And um, the Bluetooth disconnected from my phone, which was or was starting to disconnect from my phone, which was charging by my bedside. So even walking that short distance uh, started to cause them to disconnect. So I wish that it was a more modern form of Bluetooth. That would also mean better battery life as well. Uh, but Acoustic Sheep sells just the module. Um, if you go to, let's see, I'm trying to remember what the website is. Uh, let's see here. Da, da, da. Acousticsheep.com. Um, and then, yeah, they, and then tap on our products or click on our products and choose sleep phones. They sell the um, speaker and the module all by itself. Uh, there's an effortless module and a Bluetooth module. I don't know what the F, let's see what the effortless hmm. module does. Oh, so you can like make your you- own fleece covering. <laughs> the the effortless module is um, a way to use induction charging. So basically, you don't have to pull that module out and plug it in. You can just set it on the um, uh-huh. effortless charger. And so then it's wireless charging. But anyway, all that aside, what I want is Bluetooth 5 as opposed to Bluetooth 4. Um, and so I'm hoping that at some point, the company comes out with a Bluetooth 4 uh, version. And then if you are a glutton for punishment... You can get the telephones uh, by Sleep Phones, which give you the ability to, uh, I believe, <laughs> oh yeah, it's a Bluetooth transmitter that you plug into your television and then you uh. can connect it to your headphones. So if your television doesn't automatically connect to Bluetooth, then you can connect this uh, that way. That's so kind of awesome. You know, so. not disturb your partner while you're watching uh, TV. It makes sense. It's like once you get, if you're, super fan of this thing you're like well now i want to watch tv with this on too so (laughs) these are awesome i feel like this is this is like the thing that when i was a kid it's like man can you imagine if you had headphones that you could listen to while you sleep and it's like yeah now you can get them so (laughs) yes yes you can also i was fully convinced that what you were going to tell me was that you opened up the module and soldered it so that you could turn the volume down which doesn't oh. that wouldn't have all surprised me like <laughs> at all so oh. i was just waiting for it that's funny no luckily these <laughs> got quiet enough but if they didn't 
I would have tried to do something to make that work better. There's because, nothing that'll yeah. stop you. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot get in my way. Um, yeah. So this is I, I'm very impressed with uh with these acoustic sheep um sleep headphones. I don't know why I didn't get a sheep when I got my acoustic sheep headphones. Uh for people who are wondering what the heck he's talking about, um, the the site had these adorable fleece sheep, um, stuffed sheep in the background. So I may have to reach out to support and say, um, how do I get one of those? Because I want to count the sheep. But yes, these acoustic sheep um, sleep phones are very cool. I've been very happy with them. Uh, and I love that uh, they work very well for me. So yeah, if you're looking for a way to, as a side sleeper, a back sleeper, a front sleeper, an around sleeper, um, these have my my blessing as being uh, a way to fall asleep. And also the box says that they've got an app. Um, says sleep to free sleep phones and acoustic sheep soundscape apps. So you can find those as well and get those soundscapes if you'd rather just listen to those. And so now after the show is over, again, my two complaints, not Bluetooth 5 and also kind of difficult to get them back into the headphones. Uh, but that second complaint is very whiny because you don't want them to be able to sort of fall out easy. And you also don't want them to shift every time you just pull it out to charge. Um, so yeah, again, that was just a, that was, that's more of a silly complaint of mine. Also, it appears that I've been wearing them backward. Apparently they want the larger part in the back of your head, or they suggest <laughs> the larger part go in the back of your head. I was doing the larger part in the front of my head because I thought, oh, you know, you want to look cute with the logo on display while you're asleep. Uh, so I will have to make an adjustment there. But in any case, even when I was wearing them the wrong way, they were comfortable. Uh, that's my pick of the week. Let's talk about yours. Yes. So I need your help, Micah, deciding which one should be my pick because I currently need another Eero, I think. We are running into the situation where in one of the rooms... Um, we can't do video calls and calls were dropping and that it's basically just like not okay when my girlfriend works with clients. And so that's just like, Oh my God. Um, and so we have three euros, but we basically tried to move one to the other room, which meant it works great in there. And now the other room is call dropping. And so it's kind of like, dang it. I think we need to get another one. But it's kind of confusing sometimes with Eros how you upgrade this. I mean, I'm pretty sure we just have to buy one more. Um, but I'm trying to figure out which one. And then I'm assuming what I need to do is swap it out with the current one that's like my primary Euro to have the best one there. And then just use the other three from the first generation um, just throughout the rest of the home as the network extensions and i was trying to even look up i think i do have the first gen ones which it looks like they have wi-fi 5 and so that basically means the the plain Nero is still just kind of it looks even worse than the original one that i bought i'm just sort of confused um wait so think, which one are you <laughs> saying is wi-fi 5 which one? Um, the, what they currently sell is Eero, the Eero 6 extender, Eero 6, and Eero Pro 6. Just the uh -huh. plain one. It uh, looks like it's just a smaller Euro. version. Yeah. But yeah. I have like the first gen, which is bigger than these. So I think it, because I get, basically I'm confused because I get better than 350 megabytes per second, which is what they advertise that as getting. Um, yeah. I can tell you so right off, get a do not get an Eero or an Eero beacon. You either yeah. want to get the Euro 6, the Euro 6 extender, or the Euro Pro 6. Um, now, that is all going to depend on uh, if you just are wanting to use it as an extender, um, which is what it sounds like you're wanting to do with it. Versus uh, needing Ethernet ports on it? or Right, correct. Yeah, um, if you just okay. want it to be a Wi-Fi extender on its own versus if you want to have more ability oh, to... Um, to, to connect to because the Euro 6 extender, it just takes power on the back and then it adds uh, you know more Wi-Fi coverage to your home. But yeah, we can immediately cross out the Euro and the Euro beacon because that's yesterday's um, Wi-Fi connectivity. You want to get either the, the Euro 6 or the Euro um, extender, Euro 6 extender, or if you really wanted to go all in, you get the Euro Pro... Wait, 
Do you already have an Aero Pro? No, Six. that's what I'm saying is the first generation ones. I think, I think they're just, it looks like, okay, maybe it's not as much range, but I think in terms of speed, I still get 500 megabytes per second on all of those. So I would pretty much need to, what I'm just trying to figure out is if it, is it worth it to get the Pro 6 to have my main network actually broadcast full speeds or am I already getting that? And I would just be paying money for <laughs> what and would I end up what being nothing. So yeah. Um, yeah, this is where it's kind of complicated because different devices, if they, if they sense Wi-Fi six in your home, they will try to connect to that. So you would mm-hmm. be getting those better speeds. Cause I, here's That's where fair. I would like, I, I could say, don't get the Euro pro six. If you're planning on keeping that in your office where you have everything ethernet wired anyway, but if you are planning on putting the Euro Pro 6 itself in a more centralized location, a thousand percent get the Euro Pro 6. So I yeah, will tell you, for, but me, even, hmm. for me, on. I bought the Euro Pro 6. So I, I had an original Euro set. Um, and then whenever the Euro Pro 6 was announced, I uh, went ahead and pre ordered it and then got it whenever it came out. My Euro Pro 6 router is in my office. And Everything in my office pretty much connects Ethernet-wise, but my iPhone and my iPad and everything else that's in here while I'm in here is connected over Euro Pro 6, is uh, Wi-Fi 6. So I get those speeds in the place where it's most important. However, throughout mm-hmm. the rest of the house, I just have Eero beacons, old school Eero beacons. And let's see what still uh, it says about the Eero beacons. I think beacons. it's 350. Yeah. Wi-Fi yeah. 5, 350 megabytes. Um, and... I could do the, um, I've, I've replaced the original Eero that I had with that Eero Pro 6. So I could have that Eero also out in the space if I wanted to, but I've got two Eero beacons mm. and for the rest of the house that are connected over Wi-Fi, that's fine. Um, so yeah, it just, I think you have to first ask yourself, where are you putting the new device? Because if you're putting it in a location where multiple devices would be able to take advantage of it, then there's no question if you can afford it, you should go for the Euro Pro 6. But if you're putting it in a location where only kind of the the devices that are already connected over Ethernet would be able to take advantage of it, there's no reason to spend extra money because it doesn't change your Ethernet output. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out, especially because in theory actually would make even though I actually have a lot of stuff wired in the living room, which is that's kind of the main spot. But in many ways, I don't care that any of that gets any faster. And I don't, I'm most of the devices that I use are my iPad and my phone, which are in here in my office, but getting a pro six only in the office doesn't make sense because it have to start from the original source, which is downstairs. So I would like the six, the pro six might just be worth it to get even just because then if I ever have to upgrade these euros in the future. I'm at the maximum capability on the like entry point into my network, but it, I mean, even an Eero beacon might be enough because we just need it for that one other room. Um, but it's also like, we have a lot of molding and I mean, I should probably actually measure the square footage, but like it's a decent distance or there's like doors that we have pocket doors. And so it really does like create a lot of barriers, which is why we have this issue in the first place. Um, so I'm not sure. It might it might be the Pro Six. They're also like, I don't know. A lot of these are on sale, or maybe maybe that's because they're coming out with new ones, so it is a little bit more oh. affordable. And, and buying one, yeah, I is, noticed they were on sale. Sale. I was thinking, ooh, I could replace one of those beacons with a um, extender. That would be nice. It is just brutal to get into the network for the first time and spend six hundred dollars on three year old Pro Sixes. But if if I was redoing something i probably would i mean i might just get the pro it probably makes sense and then maybe I mean, eventually i could, could get another pro up here exactly yeah. you can start adding uh more to to them as you go along because that's basically what i'm doing i've got one right now next time i've got some extra cash floating around i'll grab another Eero pro 6 to replace one of the beacons that i have and then once again uh do the same thing uh so that i start to add wi-fi 6 throughout my house yeah, that is interesting. I feel like 
it, the just e, e or Eero in general makes it confusing because those models have shifted out over time and like the original ones were pretty good. Plus, I feel like my brain is like, don't buy Wi Fi extenders, even though Eero beacons are that <laughs> and it's good. It still is just like the training that I had when I was younger of those things cut your neck. Right. Half. At the time, they were just terrible. Right. Exactly. Um, now it's actually I think a real Eero product. Did it, yeah. They did it right. Um, and uh, they, yeah, it's not old school, kind of poorly done. So, but the beacon uh, would just be a lot lower. So, if uh, the extender yeah, the beacon, might be the at this date, only 60 bucks. Should, like, yeah, at this date, it would be silly to get a standard Eero or a beacon because you're using yesterday's Wi Fi technology. Any of the other three, at least you're getting Wi Fi 6. And that's what you should be doing. If you're going to spend the money okay. to upgrade, actually upgrade by getting Wi Fi 6. Well, it's adding on to, though. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't replace something in your home with it? No, I'm going to be at. So that's why I guess I couldn't get the extender because just that extension would have Wi Fi 6 and the rest of it wouldn't. Right. Yeah. So I do need okay. to get probably. The pro. I think you should just get, honestly, you should get the Eero 6 Pro because then your main device that pumps the out Wi-Fi to the rest of it, yeah, is as as much as it can be and has, uh, I think it's like tri-band or quad-band or something. I can't remember which one. And so in doing so, oh, there you go, tri-band. Um, so making that your main one that then pumps it out to the rest of the house, that's going to improve the connectivity for those other beacons or uh, relays as well. So I yeah, think what I, it's just made this whole confusing is that the original Eero had gigabit. And so now they're selling something that's worse than what I have already. Like those already, it's just not Wi-Fi 6 though. So <laughs> yeah. the speeds are there, but the device is... Ability well, to get that speed might not be there. Worse for <laughs> you. Worse for you because why do you need a gigabit setup if it can't put out more than 350 megabytes anyway? No, but that's what I'm saying. The old ones that I have are already a gigabit. And so I yes, have to get the are... Pro 6. Otherwise, anything else will be worse than the thing that's five years oh, old. Oh, I now. see what you're saying. Well, but that's not really, that's not exactly yeah, that's. I don't know the exact relationship between the speeds of the download versus what Wi-Fi 6 right. does. Um, so maybe so I'll that's, just that's the thing is that <laughs> when I, if I do a speed test right now on my iPhone, which is connected to the Wi-Fi, uh, I've got the gigabit Euro Pro 6. And so let's see what the, the top speeds are right now on my stupid Xfinity connection, um, which is gigabit. Uh, and so I'm running the test and with Wi-Fi 6, it's looking like it's going to be around 400 megabits down. Um, 430, 438, 440. Um, remind me again, what was the... Uh, so 442 down and about 35 up is, is what the test came out to be. And so that's with Wi-Fi 6. So it's not it's not even half of what the device can actually do. And I think that Amazon slash Eero are prioritizing for the greater majority of their users who don't really care about the plugged-in connection speed. They're more concerned about what the Wi-Fi can do. Um, that's, that's the big thing is that we nerds care about what happens whenever we plug in our devices and to have the best speeds possible there. But most yeah. people are connecting over Wi-Fi with their different devices and aren't you know, worried about plugging things in. So they do need uh, Wi-Fi 6 is more important than having gigabit um, speeds. But yeah, I think for you, coming from what you came from before, that Euro Pro 6 is going to be the best thing that you, that's going to be the right choice for you. Yeah, that makes sense. I think especially, that's just why I like, yeah, I think Eero made their choices more. It's like they upgraded some of the internals and just changed the design and made them smaller. And so, and not as many people needed that, I think is what they probably assumed is like, at the time, it seems like it could be, it was going to be everywhere, but still it's barely made it to most of the US. So most people only need 500 or more around there um and the main thing that i really should do is get a better ethernet cord because i just ran a speed test on my phone and despite my network being 800 downstairs on my because of the wire that i have going into my office it's only 80 which is just stupid i don't really run into an issue but it is worth remembering that if i'm going to upload a youtube video i should go downstairs <laughs> 
and especially once it's Pro 6. So thanks for the tip. And I guess the Pro 6 is 169 on sale right now. 183. Um, Oh, okay. 183. That's yeah, a bad. really good price. Um, interesting. Well, thank you. Yeah, I hope you get the Pro 6 and I hope you're super happy with it. Um, because I I am happy that I made that upgrade for mine. Um, and I would like to start adding more uh, throughout my home for sure. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, that brings us to the end of this episode of Smart Tech Today. If you have questions, thoughts, etc., you should email us, stt at twit.tv. Uh, tune in live to watch the show. Uh, new episodes are recorded every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 p.m. Pacific, 2030 UTC. Um, but the best way we think for you to get the show is by subscribing to the show in audio and video formats. You just click subscribe to audio or subscribe to video and you find your provider of choice. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, Spotify, YouTube. We try to be all the places you are so you can get the show uh, in your format of choice. Uh, this is the time where it's best to mention that you can also get all of our shows completely ad free. How? By checking out Club Twit. For seven bucks a month, you get every single Twitch show with no ads. You get your own personal feed that has all that, uh, all the shows with uh, no ads. You also get access to the Twit Plus bonus feed that has content you won't find anywhere else. Outtakes, behind the scenes stuff, uh, stuff that us hosts decide to post in there. And access to my favorite thing, the members only Discord server where you can hang out with fellow hosts, you can hang out with fellow club members, and you can chat about the show during the show. Uh, the chat was particularly popping today. We thank you for joining us. Um, Appreciate that. And if that sounds good to you, which why wouldn't it? You just head to twit.tv slash club twit. Seven bucks a month gets you all of that. But wait, there's more. If you would just like, we heard that people, you know, hey, I don't really want the seven bucks a month. I don't need all that extra stuff. I'd really just like to support my show, my specific show that I like directly. So maybe your specific show is Smart Tech Today. And uh, frankly, it would be awesome if you could support the show. If you are an Apple Podcast subscriber, now you can go uh, to the audio version of Smart Tech Today and you can subscribe for $2.99 a month. And when you subscribe, you get the ad-free version of the show. So super cool way to support a show in particular. $2.99 a month gets you uh, that show and it's completely ad-free with the audio version. Matthew Casanelli, if folks want to follow you online and check out all the great work you're doing, where do they go to do that? Uh, you can go to matthewcasanelli.com where you can find my shortcuts catalog and subscribe to the newsletter that I put out every Friday and become a member. And I'm doing a new member post on my secret files tex- techniques coming soon. So what about you? Sweet. Um, you can find me at Micah Sargent on many a social media network or head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A dot coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. Um, I There's something I usually say after that, but I don't remember what it is all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, thank you all for tuning in uh, and for watching the show every week. Uh, seriously, it's uh, super helpful, this, uh, this, this show, Smart Tech despite the fact that it continues to grow and be a big part of uh, everyone's lives, um, talking about it regularly and and uh, sort of putting the news out there is something that is a, a, a newer idea still. So your reviews of the show, your subscriptions to the show, and uh, telling other people about it helps us to continue to put out this great work and um, share with you every week the stuff that we are doing. So and don't forget... Episode- Nine or episode 100 is next week, so we yeah, bow, bow, bow. it's not that new because we've been doing it for a while, which I love. It's yes. been it's been awesome. Wow, that that almost is two years of um, well, I mean, probably was, at two years, given it went over two years for sure. We started yeah. in I think August, so wow, well, yeah. that's awesome. We're almost at episode 100. <laughs> And boy, do I feel it in my back. No, <laughs> um, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Smart Tech. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. 
Android is constantly evolving. And if you're part of the Android faithful, then you'll be just as excited about it as I am. I'm Jason Howell, host of All About Android, along with my co-hosts, Florence Ion and Ron Richards, where every week we cover the news, we cover the hardware, and we cover the apps that are driving the Android ecosystem. Plus, we invite people who are writing about Android, talking about Android, and making Android onto the show. Every Tuesday at twit.tv, look for All About Android. 